أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكل جاء الحق وزاق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوكا وننزل من القرآن ما هو الشفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا إذ الظالمين إلا خسارة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شوه لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic of this afternoon's talk is Islam and secularism. Tolerance or intolerance. Religion and secularism they are poles apart difference of chalk and cheese they are poles apart religion according to the Oxford dictionary means a belief in a superhuman controlling power a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience secularism according to the Oxford Dictionary means concerning with the affairs of the world. It also means something which is not sacred, something which is not religious. And it also means non-monastic. Islam comes from the root word salam, meaning peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to God Almighty. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to God Almighty. And the Holy Quran mentions in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, In the deena in the Allah al-Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. Islam is not a mere religion. It is a complete way of life. It's a complete code of conduct. And it deals with both. Spiritual, that is the soul, as well as physical, that's the body. It's a dual combination of both. The spiritual aspect and the physical aspect. Most of the major religions, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, especially the Catholic Church, most of the major religions, they say that if you have to come closer to God Almighty, you have to renounce the world. You have to lead a life of celibacy, of monasticism. That means, your parents, because they did not renounce the world, you came into existence in this world. You were born because your parents did not renounce the world. Indirectly insinuating that because your parents they were not religious. That's the reason that you were born. If suppose every human being agrees that according to these religions that he wants to come closer to God Almighty and he decides and she decides that they should renounce the world then within a span of 100 to 150 years human beings will cease to exist on the face of the earth. They will cease to exist. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said وسلم, there is no monasticism in Islam and according to Sayyid al-Bukhari according to Sayyid al-Bukhari volume 7 in the book of Niqah chapter number 3 Hadith number 4, our beloved Prophet said that, O oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married should get married, for it will help him to lower his gaze and guard his modesty. And according to Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, that the Prophet said, 
that anyone who marries, he completes half his deen. Once during a question after time, there was a person who asked me the question. That does it mean that if I marry twice, I complete my full deen? <laughs> what did the Prophet mean when he said that if you marry, you complete half your deen? It meant that marriage protects you from promiscuity, from fornication, from homosexuality, which are half the evil of the society. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to become a husband or a wife. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to become a father or a mother, which are important duties in Islam. So irrespective, whether you marry once or twice, yet you only complete half your deen. Islam, as I mentioned, it has a dual role. It serves, it is, has a spiritual role and a physical role. It serves the body as well as the spirit, the soul. There are people who say that I have done enough of dunya dari. Now I want to go towards deen. That means they have done enough of worldly affairs. Now they want to go towards deen, towards Islam. These people fail to realize that dunya is part of deen. Worldly affairs is a part of Islam. You cannot be a good Muslim unless you follow even the worldly affairs. To be a good Muslim, you have to do dunya dari. You have to take part in the worldly affairs. Without taking part in worldly affairs, you cannot be a good Muslim. But the Holy Quran at the same time says in Surah Nisa, Chapter 4, verse number 171. La Do not go to extremes in your deen, in your way of life. That means, don't do too much of worldly affairs and neglect the other part of deen. There has to be a striking balance between the two. Therefore I say that Islam is the most secular religion. As I mentioned earlier, according to Oxford Dictionary, Secularism means something which is not monastic and Islam prohibits monasticism. Secularism means something concerned with the affairs of this world. And Islam says that if you want to be a good Muslim, you should be concerned with the worldly affairs. So in this sense, Islam is the most secular religion. There are people who have different definitions of secularism. When I say Islam is secular, it means that we should live in harmony with the people. Living in harmony does not mean that you have to be a hypocrite. There are some people who say that even Ram is God and even Rahman is Allah. Even Ram is Allah, even Rahman is Allah. Especially the politician. They scratch the back of the non-Muslim to please them. And some people who say that Jesus, peace be upon him, even he is God and even Allah is God. This I do not say is secularism, I call it as hypocrisy. Living in harmony means that suppose there is a teacher. Suppose there are two teachers. One teacher says that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. And the other teacher says that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. Living in harmony does not mean that you have to agree with both the teachers. You don't have to agree with falsehood. You have to say that I agree with the first teacher that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. I do not agree with the second teacher 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, but I will not fight with him. I will only convey the message of truth, but I will not fight with him. I will live in harmony with him. This is the meaning of secularism. There are some Muslims who say that the Holy Quran says Lakum dinukum deen. That means to use your way to me is mine. Therefore, you need not talk about Islam to the non-Muslim. Islam is very secular. They are quoting the Holy Quran out of context. What they're quoting is the verse of Surah Al-Kafirun, chapter 109. 
verse number 6. Which does say, Lakum dinukum valiadin. That to you is your way, to me is mine. But if you have to quote this verse, it is compulsory that you also quote the first five verses of the surah. Which says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدْ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا أَعْبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدْ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلْيَدِينَ Which means, say to those who reject faith, the question of rejecting the faith only arises if you present the truth to them. So only after you present the truth of Islam to them, does the question of rejection arise. So the Holy Quran says, that say to those who reject faith, I worship not what you worship, nor will you worship that which I worship. I will not be worshipping that which you want me to worship, nor will you worship what I worship. To you is your way and to me is mine. Only after you proclaim the first five verses do you have the right to say the sixth verse of Surah Al-Kafirun. There are other Muslims, mainly the politicians, who say that the Holy Quran says, La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion religion. Therefore, you need not talk about Islam. Let him follow his way of life and we have to be bothered about our way of life. Again, they are quoting out of context. They are quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, which does say, like deen, that there is no compulsion in religion, but they have to complete the verse. It further says that truth stands out clear from error. Anyone who rejects the evil and believes in Allah, he has held the strong hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which never breaks. And anyone who rejects faith and believes in the evil one, he will take you from light to darkness. And anyone who rejects evil and believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will take you from darkness unto light. You have to complete the verse. I do agree there is no compulsion religion, but truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth to them, then you cannot force them. Forcing Islam at the point of the sword, it is useless. The Holy Quran also says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, it says that revile not those who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Quran says that you should not abuse those people who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, it says, Ya ayyuhan nasu, inna khalaknakum min zakri wa unsa wa ja'alnakum shawbaw wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum inda allahi atkakum inna allaha alimun khabir which means, O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, who has righteousness, who has God consciousness, who has piety. And Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. So the only criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not color, it's not caste, it's not race, it's not wealth, it's not sex, it's not age, but it is taqwa. It's righteousness, it's God consciousness, it's piety. And the best example of universal brotherhood that we can see in our life is that we have to offer salah five times a day, it's compulsory. And our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari in volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 75. Hadith number 692, our beloved Prophet said that when you stand for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. 
so that and the other hadith says that stand shoulder to shoulder so that the devil does not come in between you a prophet was not referring to the devil which you see in the museum which has got two horns and a tail he was referring to the devil of racism of color of caste of creed of wealth that irrespective whether you're black or white whether rich or poor from whichever nation you come from when you offer salah you should stand shoulder to shoulder it increases the brotherhood and we practice universal brotherhood every day five times a day and the other beautiful example of universal brotherhood is when we go for hajj that's the pilgrimage and every muslim who has the means to perform hajj he should at least perform the hajj once in his lifetime and the gathering in hajj that's in makkah it is the biggest annual gathering in the whole world where about two and a half million people gather every year and irrespective whether they're rich or poor black or white or yellow the men they wear the same clothes they wear two piece of unsewn cloth preferably white you cannot identify the person standing next to you whether he's a king or a pauper it's the best example of universal brotherhood that we live together people from various parts of the world from japan from america from england from india from indonesia from malaysia they gather together and demonstrate the best universal brotherhood in any religion and the holy quran says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 17 it says walaqad karamna bani adama that we have honored the children of adam peace be upon him it does not say a particular race or a particular sex all the children of adam peace be upon him have been honored by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the holy quran says in surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 135 that ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu o you who believe stand out firmly for justice as witness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it be against yourself against your parents against your kith and kin or against the rich or poor for allah protects both and follow not the lust of your heart lest you will be swerved neither distort justice nor decline from speaking the truth for allah likes those who are just that means we have to stand for justice even if it be against yourself against your parents or against the relatives the holy quran says in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 32 that if any of you kill any human being except if it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land it is as though he has killed all the people and if any of you save one person one human being it is as though you have saved all the people the whole of human race there was an incident at the time of hazrat ali may allah be pleased with him who was the fourth khalifa of islam that a muslim had murdered a zimmi a zimmi is a non muslim who is protected in an islamic state living in an islamic state he was murdered so the prophet said that this muslim who murdered a zimmi should be put to death later on the brother of the zimmi said that i don't mind forgiving the person who has murdered my brother and accepting the money that's that money but hazrat ali may allah be pleased with him he was not sure and he said no the muslim should be put to death only later on after confirmation and after coaxing from the brother that i actually forgive him and accept the blood money then did hazrat ali may allah be pleased with him let him go free and said that the life of a zimmi that is a non muslim living in islamic state is as sacred as the life of a muslim and the property of a zimmi and a muslim is equally valuable 
there are many people, there are many critics who misquote the Quran, who quote out of context and say that the Holy Quran says that wherever you find a kafir, wherever you find a non-Muslim, you have to kill him. And they quote very often, Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, which says that wherever you find a kafir, you slay him. Indicating that the Holy Quran says that whenever you find a non-Muslim, you should put him to death. Trying to say that Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless religion. They are quoting out of context. This verse of the Holy Quran was revealed as there was a peace treaty between the mushriks of Mecca and the Muslims. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks. And later on in the battlefield, this verse was revealed. You have to quote it in context. For example, suppose the President of America or the Army General of America, when there's a fight between America and Vietnam, suppose he says to the American soldiers that wherever you find a Vietnamese during the battlefield, wherever you find a Vietnamese, you put him to death. But natural, he's quoting it on the battlefield. He's saying it to boost the morale of the American soldiers. But today if I quote the President of America saying that he said that wherever you find a Vietnam, you kill him, I will make him sound like a butcher. If I quote out of context, you have to quote in context. And but natural, any general of the army, to boost up the morale of his, the soldiers of the army, he will but naturally say that don't get scared. Fight the enemy. And then you find them, kill them. That's a normal law of military. And there are people like Arun Shuri, there are critics, who after quoting this verse, Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 5, jump to verse number 7. Any logical person can realize that he has missed verse number 6. Because verse number 6 gives the answer. It says that if any pagan, if any mushrik, if any idol worshipper, if any kafir wants asylum, give it to him. So that he may hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and escort him to a place, to a place of security. The Holy Quran does not only say that if a mushrik, if a kafir wants asylum, just give it to him. The Holy Quran says, escort him to a place of security. I want to ask that which army general today in this world will say that if the enemy wants, if he wants asylum, the maximum he may say is let him go free. He will never say that escort him to a place of security. And Holy Quran says that, that if any enemy, if any kafir wants asylum, let him go free. Not just like that, escort him to a place of security, to a place of safety. So people quote the Quran out of context and they misquote the Quran and make Islam to look as though it's a ruthless religion. In fact, our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he said that during battlefield you should not hurt any woman or children, that you should not chop down any trees, that you should not burn any fields, that you should not kill any cattle, that if you have made a promise, you should keep your promise. You should not harm those people who have renounced the world, nor destroy any monastery or place of worship. The Holy Quran says in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 8, that Allah forbids not that you be kind to those people who fight you not against your faith, not drive you from your homes. For Allah loves those who are just and kind. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that amongst the non-Muslims who do not fight your faith, who do not drive you out of your homes, Allah expects that you be kind and just to them. For Allah loves those who are just and kind. The next verse say, 
Allah forbids only from behaving with those people who fight you against your faith and drive you out of your homes and support those people who drive you out of your home from turning towards them for friendship and protection. For all those who do so are verily in the wrong. That means if a non-Muslim fights you against your faith, drives you out of your house and supports those people who drive you out of your house, you should not turn towards them for friendship and protection. I mean, there is a misconception amongst the people that Islam was spread by the sword. And the best answer to this misconception was given by De Lacy O'Leary in his book, Islam at the Crossroad, on page number 8, where he says that history makes it clear History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping through the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered nations, is the most fantastically absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. Delacy O'Leary, a non-Muslim, he says this, that the historians the most fantastically absurd myth that the historians have repeated is that Islam was forced down the throat of the people at the point of the sword. We know that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We did not do the job. We did not force Islam at the point of the sword. Neither did we convey the message of Islam. We didn't do dawah. Later on when the crusaders came, we Muslims were wiped out. There was not a single Muslim who could give the azan openly. We were completely wiped out. Why? Because we didn't use the sword and neither did we propagate our religion of Islam. We Muslims, we were the lordship of the Arab land for about 1400 years. A few years the Britishers came, a few years the French came, but overall we Muslims ruled Arabia for about 1400 years and still we are ruling it. Today, you will be shocked to know that there are 14 million Coptic Christians who are Arabs living in Arabia. Coptic Christian means they were born, they were born as Christians. That means there are more than 14 million non-Muslims living in the hearts of the Muslims. If Islam was spread by the sword, there would not have been a single non-Muslim in the Arab land. It's a living proof that Islam was not spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India, the Mughals. They ruled India for a, about a thousand years. But we didn't do the job properly. We did not propagate the religion of Islam. We didn't do dawah. Neither did we convert anyone at the point of the sword. If we would have converted all the non-Muslims at the point of the sword, there would not have been a single non-Muslim living in India. And today we know that the Muslim population is hardly about 15%. It's a minority. And the non-Muslims are about 85%. If Islam was spread at the point of the sword, there would not have been a single non-Muslim living in the whole of India. The non-Muslims living in India are giving shahada. They are giving witness that Islam was not spread by the sword. I want to ask the question that which army went to Malaysia? More than 50% of the Malaysians are Muslims. Which army went to Indonesia? More than 90% of the Indonesians are Muslim. And the country which has the maximum number of Muslims in any country, it's Indonesia. Which army went to Indonesia? Which army conquered the east coast of Africa? Which sword? The answer is given by Thomas Carlyle in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, which he mentioned on page number 80. That sword, indeed it was the sword. But Every new opinion initially starts in the minority of one. 
in one man's head alone it dwells. One man against the whole world. One man against all the human beings. It will do little good that he should spread with a sword. He should first get the sword. So that it will propagate itself. Which sword? The sword of the intellect. The Holy Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 125, it says, Udu ila rabbika That is, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. <coughs> According to the Reader Digest, al Manik and your book that was mentioned in 1986, it said, it gave the statistics of the increase of the various religions of the world from the year 1934 to 1984. In the span of 50 years, various religion, it gave the increase of various religion, the growth of various religion. And number one was Islam, 235%. And Christianity was hardly 47%. I want to ask that which Muslim army converted people in this last century? Which Muslim forced people to accept Islam at the point of the sword? Which Muslim in this past half a century? Today in America, the fastest growing religion is Islam. In Europe, the fastest growing religion is Islam. I want to know that which Muslim in America and Europe is converting people at the point of the sword? Which Muslim? The Holy Quran clearly gives the answer. And as I mentioned, that Islam is a secular religion, is the most secular religion because it does not believe in monasticism and it deals with worldly affairs. But Islam is very tolerant to secularism. But secularism is intolerant towards Islam. Because secularism says that we have nothing to do with anything which is sacred and religious. They aren't bothered about the truth, whether they speak the truth or not. If it is sacred, we will not tolerate it. If it is religious, we will not tolerate it. So secularism is intolerant towards Islam. And Islam, alhamdulillah, is very tolerant towards secularism. The sword. Which sword? Which sword is making people accept Islam? The Holy Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, and Surah Al-Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, it says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَالدِّينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُزْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ that Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms, whether it be atheism, whether it be secularism, whether capitalism, whether socialism, whether Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam is destined to supersede all, to overcome them all, kulli, to master them all however much the mushrik don't like it. And the similar message is repeated in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, where it says, Huwa allazi hira wa ala kulli wa billahi shahida. That it is Allah who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms, whether it be secularism, atheism, socialism, capitalism, Christianism, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. Islam is destined to supersede all, overcome them all, master them all, and enough is Allah as a witness. Which sword, even if he had a laser gun, we could not have used it because the Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 256, like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Even if he had a laser gun, we could not use it. Which sword? Our sword is the Holy Quran. Our laser gun is the Holy Quran. It reaches the hearts directly. 
it conquers the mind directly. This is our laser gun. This is our sword. And I start my talk by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81 and 82, which says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ وَنُنَزُّلُ مِنَ الْقُرَانِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءً وَرَحْمَةُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا إِذْزِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا That when truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For by its nature, falsehood is bound to perish. The Holy Quran was revealed in stages so that it will be a mercy and a healing to the believers. And as for those who are unjust, it is nothing but loss after loss. Which sword? Which sword are we using? And the answer is given very well. I would like to end it with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Yes, brother, most welcome. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, if we read the, the modern history of Islam, let's say, for example, the time... So, so. No problem. I'll repeat the question. You can say, brother. From the time the, uh, the British Congress <coughs> in Egypt, it seems that under the colon during the colonial period, Muslims did a better job of organization and educating one another with less technology than they do today. Can you possibly explain why this is? Well, the brother has asked the question that in modern history, for example, Egypt, he said. Contemporary writers, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, tend to start what they consider to be the modern period of uh, Islamic history with the, con the British conquest of Egypt in the 1880s. Now, the brother said that in modern Islamic history, example, Egypt, when we won the colonial rule, by British, etc. We did more progress. After that, we came down. Why is it so? But if you analyze that the media, the media has been controlled by the non-Muslims, mainly by the Westerners. So what they teach us, we hear. We may not know whether there is the truth or not. The Western media says that from the 8th century till the 11th century, it was the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? It was dark for the Westerners. <laughs> In fact, science was at its peak. With the limited resources, the amount of advance made the Arabs made, they were at the top. But because it was dark for the Westerners, they said it's the Dark Age. It was not the Dark Age. With the limited resources, with the limited equipment that we had, the amount the Arab scholars, Alhamdulillah, they progressed is phenomenal. But people don't know about them. For example, blood circulation. If you ask a normal layman, who had discovered it? Most of them will say William Harvey. 1000 years after the Quran was revealed. But they don't know that 400 years before William Harvey, Ibn Nafis had talked about the blood circulation. But no one knows Ibn Nafis, everyone knows William Harvey. See, astronomy was at its peak at the time. If you analyze, you can give a talk only on the achievement made by the Muslims. Much before, that's in the 8th to the 11th century. For example, Ali Drusi, he drew the map of the world in 1159, 1154, sorry, when people thought the world was flat. Everyone knows Pythagoras theorem. Who discovered it? Ali Drusi. That the square of the hypotenuse of a triangle is equal to the sum of the other two sides of the triangle. Who discovers it? Who knows about Al-Kindi? Al-Kindi, he was a famous philosopher, as an astronomer. When people like Descartes and Newton and Galileo said that all physical laws are absolute, Al-Kindi said that it was relative. Later on, Albert Einstein, he took the theory of Al-Kindi and did more research and talked about the theory of relativity. He got a Nobel Prize. Everyone knows about Albert Einstein, no one knows about Al-Kindi. Muhammad, Shakir, Ahmad, these three brothers, they set the exact surface area of the earth by measuring a degree at the Red Sea. No one knows about them in chemistry. 
It's known as Jabir ibn Hayyan, known as Gabar by the Western world. He wrote 2,000 pages on chemistry. He discovered alcohol. Alcohol is the Arabic word coming from Al-Gul, meaning spirit. Same with Muhammad Zakaria Razi. He was an authority in, in the disease of smallpox and measles. Ibn Sina, known as the Aristotle of the East. He wrote two volumes, The Disease and the Cure. We were very much advanced, but because the media is in their hand, we don't know about it. But I also partly agree with you, brother, that we Muslims today aren't advancing. You know why? Because we have gone away from our religion. We have gone away from the Quran. And the reason the Westerners are advancing, the answer is same, because they have gone away from their religion. Muslims have become backward because they have gone away from our religion. The Westerners have become advanced because they have gone away from their religion. The answer is the same. So if you analyze, we Muslims, alhamdulillah, now, alhamdulillah, previously we were close to the Quran. Now we are going away from the Quran. So if we stuck to the Quran and the say hadith, inshallah, once again we'll be on the top. Hope that answers the question. I mean, if there are questions from sister side, they can give it on a chit of paper. And inshallah, we'll have one from gents, one from one sister side. Women's role in society, are they allowed to work if yes? Under what condition? I have given this answer in detail in my video cassette. Women's rights in Islam modernizing outdated. The question posed was, can a woman work in Islam? And if yes, under what condition? First, we should realize that the financial obligation in a family is laid on the shoulder of the man. Before a woman is married, it is the duty of the father and the brother. And after she's married, it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after her boarding, lodging, clothing and all financial aspects. She is financially more secured than the male. So a woman in Islam need not work, she does not have to work for a living. Someone else, that is the male in the family, looks after her financial aspect. But if there is, if there is any problem in the family where both the ends don't meet, she can work. Not the, that she has to work. No one can force her to work. But if she wishes out of free will, she can work. But natural, the work she does should be within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. There is no text in the Holy Quran saying that the woman cannot do any lawful work. The work that she does should be within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. But natural, she should have the Islamic hijab, she should be modestly dressed up, and there should not be intermingling of the sexes. If she's working in any area, the best is preferable that there should be segregation of the sexes. Segregation of the sexes. Like if there is a factory which has different places of work for men and for the women, that's very good, alhamdulillah. If if they're working in a common place, there should be a level of hijab. That unnecessary talking should not be there. Unnecessary talking. And she should be in a modesty level. The way she behaves, she should wear the Islamic hijab. That's very much required. Otherwise, she can work at home also. She can do pottery. She can do weaving. She can do knitting. She can even work in factories, as I said, following the Islamic Sharia. She can also do business. The best businesswoman at the time of the Prophet was his wife, Bibi Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. She was a very successful businesswoman. In today's age, if a woman wants to do business, she can do business. Preferable if she does it through her husband or a son or a father or a brother. She should maintain the Islamic hijab. And whatever she earns, she need not spend a single pie on her family or even on herself. She can invest that full amount if she wants. If she wants to willingly spend on the family, she has a right. And if she doesn't want to work, even if the family is poor, no one can force her. It's the duty of the husband to look after her lodging, boarding and all financial aspects. We require in today's age that some of our sisters should become doctors, should become gynecologists, should become teachers. Because if I want my wife that when she goes to a doctor, I prefer that she should go to a female doctor, then why don't we make our sisters a doctors? We don't want to make our women folks educated, but we want our wife to go to a lady doctor. It's hypocrisy. So, but natural work is allowed, but within the Islamic Sharia. Hope that answers the question. Wa alaikum as
Brother, one of the things that attracted me to Islam uh, is the fact that Allah is, is genderless. But one of the questions that I'm uh, constantly confronted with is, especially that uh, non-Muslim is why does Allah refer to as He in the Quran? Oh, that's a very good question, the brother has said. That the reason that the brother was, has been attracted towards Islam, I believe he's a revert, alhamdulillah. I congratulate you and I welcome you to the fold of Islam. The question was, he has been attracted because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, in the religion of Islam, he has got no gender. But why is he referred as he? Therefore, we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God. Because the God can be played around with. If you add S to God, it becomes God's plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allah had. Say it Allah one and only. If you add D-E-S-S to God, it becomes a female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah is unique. He has got no gender. If you add Father to God, it becomes Godfather. There's nothing like Allah, Abba or Allah Father in Islam. Therefore, we prefer the Arabic word Allah. Now the question was that why in the Holy Quran, maybe by reading the translation, you read that Kul Hu Allah Hu Ahad. Say He is Allah one and only. Why? Because if you analyze in Arabic, it is Hua. Hua means He. Now you should realize that Arabic language has got only two genders. <coughs> Feminine and masculine. There's no neuter gender like in the English language. There's no neuter gender in Arabic. Only masculine and feminine. Now for referring to a male in Arabic, it is Hua. And to a female it is Hia, She. Hua means He, Hia means She. Now since there is no neuter gender, you have to use one of the two. Now you may ask that why is it Hua? It could also be Hia, She. If there is no neuter gender, because if you translate any English word into Arabic, Hia can be translated as He as well as It. Hua can be translated as He as well as It because there is no neuter gender in Arabic. Similarly, Hia can be translated as She or as well as It. Both. Now why does Quran use Hua? It could also use Hia. Why Hua? The reason is that while I was learning little bit of Arabic grammar, I was told that there are certain rules of Arabic grammar. That when it comes to gender, there are certain rules for feminine gender. For feminine gender, that if it is ending with the, for example, Mirabhatun, like fan, it becomes a feminine gender. You have to use she. She. Like things, like table, chair, etc. It doesn't have a gender. So should, should we say masculine or feminine? If it ends in the, like Mirabhatun, like the fan, it becomes female. That's the first law of grammar. The second law, of, and since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not end with her, does Allah end with her? No, so you cannot say that it's a female. Coming to the second point, that if it is specifically a woman like mother, ummu, ammi, then it's a feminine gender. There's nothing specific about Allah as mother, etc. So it can't be feminine. The third law is that if it is in pairs, like air, eyes, ainun, Eyes, yadun, hands. If it's in pair, it becomes feminine. So I is a feminine gender. Hand is a feminine gender because it's in pairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kul hu Allah hu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. It's not in pairs. So if you want to give a preference, whether to call it he it or she it, you would prefer he it. That is hua. Kul hu Allah hu ahad. Actually, Allah has got no gender, but because the Arabic language had got no neuter gender, therefore the Quran says, say he is Allah one and only. And when you translate, because Allah is translated as God, in English language we translate Hua as he. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum As-salam. In speaking with Christians, how should we handle the topic of original sin and vicarious atonement? The brother asked the question <coughs> that when we deal with the Christians, how do we deal the topic of original sin or about attainment? <laughs> atonement? They say they have a concept of original sin, that because Adam, peace be upon him, he had the apple, he sinned. And it was Eve, peace be upon her, that she tempted Adam to eat the apple. So because of her, all humankind is born in sin. 
and the Bible, it curses in Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 16. It says, you woman, you shall toil in labor pain. It was a curse given by God Almighty because she sinned, pregnancy is a curse. In the Holy Quran, pregnancy uplifts a woman. It says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. Pregnancy uplifts the woman, but the Bible degrades degrade the woman. Saying the labor pain is a curse. Now coming to your question, how will you deal with them? That because they sinned, every human being is born in sin. I ask a question to the Christian, that did Adam peace be upon him before eating the forbidden fruit? Did he ask me? He didn't ask me. So if he didn't ask me, how am I to blame? If he would have asked me, then you could have said, okay, I guided him that you eat the forbidden fruit. Then you can blame me. If he's asked you, then fine. He didn't ask me. So when Adam peace be upon him, and if peace be upon her, when they didn't ask me, how am I to blame? But the Christian missionary, they quote, the quote that is mentioned in the Bible, in the, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, they say, the soul that sinned shall die. That means any soul that commits a sin, they shall die. Therefore, since Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they ate the forbidden fruit, every humankind is born in sin. Therefore, for receiving salvation, you have to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that he died for our sin. They are quoting half the verse of the Bible. Ezekiel chapter number 18, verse number 20, does say, the soul that sinneth shall die. But they are putting a full stop where there is no full stop. It continues and says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father shall bear the iniquity of the son. If the sin of the son will not be borne by the father, neither the father shall bear the sins of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked turn, they shall not die. So the Bible says, according to Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, that sin is not inherited. So your whole theory of the original sin is proved false by your own Bible. The Quran clearly says that no bearer of the burden can bear the burden of the other. No bearer of whatever you do, you will be held responsible. What your father does, he will be held responsible. And same message is given in the Bible. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> my sister asked a question that Judaism and Christianism is mentioned in the Holy Quran and that it's a deen. Why is not Hinduism and Buddhism etc. mentioned in the Holy Quran as a deen? Sister, nowhere does the Quran say that Christianism and Judaism is a deen. The Quran clearly says, in the deena in the Allah al-Islam. I started my talk by quoting that. The only religion, the only deen acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. It's not a way of life. It's a religion. Judaism and Christianity, the Quran speaks about that. It speaks about Ahle Kitab, but it never says that it's the right way of life. It never says that it's a right deen. By, by name, the Holy Quran mentions four revelations. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Furqan. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the revelation, the Wahi given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, that is the Holy Quran, is the Wahi, the revelation given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But otherwise, Several revelations have came down the face of the earth. For example, so for Ibrahim. There were revelations given to other prophets. My name, there are only 25 prophets mentioned in the Holy Quran. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But our tradition say that there are 124,000 prophets sent on the face of the earth. So Hinduism and Buddhism, they aren't mentioned in the Quran. That does not mean they did not exist. Because only four revelations have been mentioned by name, and only 25 messengers have been mentioned by name in the Holy Quran. But the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter number 20, Chapter 35, verse number 24, it says, Wa immin ummatin illa khalafiha nazeed. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. Quran says in Surah Rad, chapter 13, verse number 7, Wa likulli kaum in had. To every nation have we sent a warner or a guide. 
So these about Hinduism, Buddhism, Parsism, the Quran does not specify. But that does not mean because the Quran does not speak about it, they did not exist at all. They existed. Like Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 62, that all those who follow the Quran and the scriptures, the Jewish people, the Christian people and the Sabians. Who are the Sabians? They say they were in between. In between Christians and Jews, some people say. Some people say they are the fire worshippers. They can refer to the Parsi people. Whatever it is, there are religions besides Islam, Christianity and Judaism. But the name is not mentioned in the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Please, those who have not asked before, I'll give them the chance first. Yes, brother. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Shh. Please, would you prefer having one, one question from the gent side, one from the lady side, so that we so do we'll justice to both? If you can, one question from the gent side, one from the lady side.